colleagues, Sandy McLaughlin, Elizabeth Harris, and Ron Bernal, we're pleased and um, truly honored to present this 219 Clark Solomon historical vignette entitled Women in Polydology. In doing so, we celebrate the accomplishments and lives of the contributions of, of three uh, different women who have, who have made uh, significant discoveries that have changed the field of biology. None of the presenters reported in Congress. This name lectureship is in honor of the late Dr. Clark Solomon, professor of medicine at Tufts University, who served as president of the American Fire Association for many years and energetically led the history and archives committee. He was a distinguished physician and historian who made important contributions to the history of endocrinology and uh, particularly fibrobiology. Indeed, his historical vignettes were a perennial favorite of this meeting. Those of us who knew him remember him with great uh, respect and admiration. Dr. Solomon's historical vignettes focus not only on the scientific and scholarly contributions of the subjects, but sought to eliminate their careers and life journeys by personal stories and anecdotes uncovered through careful review and research. In this presentation, we'll follow his lead and provide a glimpse into the personal life stories of these scientists, discuss their paradigm changing discoveries and describe how their work influenced the direction of investigation within their respective fields and beyond. I'll preface my remarks today by pointing to the heightened profile of women in the American Fire Association. Women members, including all types of membership, now number almost 750, accounting for almost 40% of the uh, total membership. This compares with 9% in 2003 and 20% in 2008. The trailblazing women that we will highlight today will no doubt, will no doubt have been pleased by this. I'm grateful to the members of the Women in Biology Task Force for their support and advocacy of this historical presentation. Dr. Rothman and Kit Rivers hugely uh, influenced the discipline of biology, specifically regarding the history of fire farming, which revolutionized our understanding of thyroid hormone metabolism and effect. Her scientific contributions were highlighted as, as the subject of this part of the historical event last year, which was delivered by Valerie Goldman. Today we'll focus on two other trailblazing women. I'll present on Dr. Deborah Dolinak the additional comments made by Deborah McLaughlin, by Sandy McLaughlin. This will be followed by Elizabeth Pierce's presentation on Dr. Gabriel Memorial de Escobar that will be supplemented by Dr. Juan Bernal. Much of what I learned about Dr. Dolinak's scholarly career came about through reviewing the scientific literature and um, writings about her by others as well as my discussions with colleagues with whom she worked directly, including Hima Gretzhaya and uh, Ricardo Puchel Correa. To gain insight into her uh, personal story, I reached out to Dr. Joliet's son, Dr. Sebastian Joliet, who is now a professor emeritus of theoretical physics and a photon scientist at Stanford. And also to her granddaughter, Dr. Tabitha Doniak, a family physician in Santa Rosa, California. Both gave her their time most generously. They shared family stories, photographs, and anecdotes. And I'm enormously grateful to them both. They sent their warm greetings to this audience and they indicated how proud they are that the life of Dr. Doniak is being celebrated in this fashion. Deborah Abelea was born in Geneva in 1912 to Ukrainian parents. Her father was a conscious pianist and her mother taught modern dance. Deborah had a fragmented early education during World War I, owing to living in a very 
various times in Paris, Vienna, and Italy. While she learned those languages at an early age, her formal education did not begin until age nine, when she first learned to read while staying in an Italian convent with her mother and sister. They moved to Palestine three years later to join her father, then a professor at the Jerusalem Conservatory of Music. As a teenager in Palestine, Deborah met Ithra Lonia, known as Sunny, who lived in Tommy Kong, her husband. From Palestine, she moved to Paris to attend high school at the Lycée Molière, and subsequently began medical studies at the Sorbonne. Following her marriage to Sunny in 1933, she interrupted her medical studies and moved to London with him, where their son Sebastian and daughter Vera were born. Deborah subsequently resumed her studies at the Royal Free Hospital Medical School, graduating in 1945. At that time, Sonny was a pathologist at the Middlesex Hospital and an expert on, on cell growth, thyroid cancer, and the um, potential carcinogenetic effects of radioiodine on the thyroid. Deborah and Sonny were married uh, for seven years happily. Following graduation from medical school, Dr. Doniak served as health physician and junior medical officer before going on to work in the pathology department at the Royal Free, where she led the basal metabolic laboratory. In 1953, she became a research assistant in endocrinology at the Middlesex under the supervision of Rupert Vaughn Hudson, a thyroid surgeon. While there, she developed a keen interest in immunology and lymphocytic or Hashimoto's thyroiditis. During that time, she also began her long and fruitful collaboration with the chemist and immunologist, Ivan Boyd. In the 60s, Dr. Doniak joined the faculty of the Department of Immunology at the Middlesex and rose to full professor of clinical immunology. She formally retired from that position in her late 70s, but continued publishing through the following decade. She died on New Year's Day, 2004, at the age of 92. Raniel Tanifa, who you see in, in the uh, top of that uh, figure, uh, recalled that her grandmother was a great lover of the arts. While attending art school in Cambridge, she frequently accompanied Deborah to art galleries and theater. Tanifa, in her discussions with me, used the term outre to describe her free thinking grandmother. To find conventional norms of the time, Deborah and Sonny welcomed into their home a colleague who who had been fired from the Middlesex for having a child out of wedlock. In addition, their social circle was said to include many gay friends. Deborah was well-traveled and lectured in meetings across Europe and America. She maintained close, long-lasting relationships with colleagues and friends, especially with Ivan Boyd, seen above with Dr. Doniak, and Franco Locasso. She was quite close to Bridget Balfour, seen below, She's well known for her own studies of beryl cells or dendritic cells and their role in initiating immune reactions. In addition, Deborah found mentoring younger colleagues to be particularly satisfying. Deborah's talents extended beyond medicine as she was an excellent cook, an avid gardener, and had a fine soprano voice. She was a linguist who spoke no fewer than seven languages, including Russian and she was energetic, vivacious, warm, and genuinely interested in everybody and everything. Her weekend lunches, her colleagues, friends, and neighbors at the country cottage and garden pictured here were legends. She had thoroughly mastered and enjoyed a healthy work-life balance. Deborah was not known to be a shrinking violent and had strong held opinions which she shared without fear. During lectures, for example, she could be heard to give an audibly critical running commentary. Now let's turn our attention to Professor Doniak, a clinical scientist, and the scientific lead for which she is primarily known. 
we should remember that the scientific environment Dr. Joliet entered his century was one in which the received wisdom stated that circulating antibodies recognize non-self exclusively. This concept was heavily influenced by the German physicist physician scientist Paul Ehrlich, who in 1900 wrote, the body possesses certain contrivances by means of which the immunity reaction is prevented from acting against the organism's own elements and giving rise to autotoxins, which were, the, which if that were to occur, would be the dire situation you refer to as horror autotoxins. Johnson, 1956, a seminal year to founder autoimmunity, highlighted by these three papers published that year. One below described the discovery by Adam and Hertz of the serum factor in the, face, in the serum of patients with brain disease, termed long acting thyroid stimulator, or LADS, which of course was later shown to be stimulatory TSH receptor autoantibodies. The other two, on which I will elaborate, relate to the immunology of lymphocytes. In that year, Rose and Tetsky published the results of active immunization of rabbits with thyroid gland extract. The animals developed antithyroid antibodies, and in addition, intrathyroidal lymphoid changes are seen in these animals. Notably, animals developing the highest antibody titers show the most extensive lymphoid change that's represented in panel B. Other studies by Rose and Lisevsky reveal that thyroids from previously immunized animals contain less specific antigen than found in normal rats. While they concluded that the results represented loss of self tolerance to thyroid antigen, ironically, they did not at the time appreciate this to be a model of a non human disease. Enter Deborah Dominac, now a researcher in endocrinology at Middlesex. While examining the surgical thyroid specimens from patients with Hashimoto's, she noted that they contain numerous plasma cells, cells known to produce antibodies. To study the systemic effect, effect of surgery for Hashimoto's disease, she performed pre- and post-op serum protein electrophoresis and observed that the gamma globulin protein fraction known to contain antibodies fell from elevated levels in panel A to normal levels in panel B by four months following the thyroidectomy. She discussed these findings with her colleague, Ivan Royce, reportedly while waiting for a bus in the rain in London. Together, they made the intuitive leap that the excess antibodies in the preoperative serum may have been produced by the intrathyroid plasma cells and might in fact be directed against the thyroid itself. <coughs> Let's now hear in Zodiac's own words how this came about. This text was taken from a monograph of a wealth of symposium on the history of autoimmunity that was held in London in 1997 and featured Zodiac and Roy. So Zodiac said, in June 1956, Ivan showed me a picture in the Journal of Immunology, the one by Rosa Lutevsky, of a thyroid gland from a rabbit immunized with thyroid extract. This seemed to me to show a striking resemblance to human tumor lymphomatosa, or Hashimoto's thyroiditis, as she had been in the habit of looking at those thyroid glands postoperatively. Ivan and I talked about Lutevsky's experiments and what they could mean. He asked me to bring him a human thyroid from which to prepare thyroid globulin in the serum patient with Hashimoto's motors and boilers. I then made an extract of the gland and set up the precipitin test and obtained positive results. Here are those results. This is, in fact, a paper in its entirety, which was accepted promptly by the Lancet. And the single figure shows us serum from pre-op Hashimoto's patients form precipitants with extracts from Hashimoto's glands, while serum from patients four months post-op did only slightly the single plus in the precipitin uh, uh, row. Serum from normal individuals and those with 
other conditions were negative. Importantly, experiments using extracts of raised glands or normal thyroid instead of Hashimoto's thyroid gave the same result. From this, they concluded that patients with Hashimoto's are immunized against thyroid modulin. They further hypothesized that the destruction of the gland might be caused by interaction between autoantibodies and thyroid modulin within the gland. These novel insights gained them the Van Meter Prize in 1957. Here's the publication accompanying that lecture that provides additional evidence that Hashimoto's era recognized thyroid modulin. You see this octalonic agar gel plate containing Hashimoto's era in the middle well. The confluence of the antigen antibody precipitation lines indicates commonality between the antigens contained in the four surrounding wells. Within a few years, Billiac and Lloyd demonstrated that cytotoxic antibodies, different from antithyroglobulin antibodies, are also present in Hashimoto's era. This figure indicates that the cytotoxicity of the Hashimoto's era correlates with both the degree of cytoplasmic staining and its ability to fix complements. Further studies showed that the cytotoxicity was unaffected by prior absorption of the zero with thyroglobulin, but was abolished by prejudication with thyroid fractures containing high content of microsomal antigen. Hence, the first description of cytotoxic and microsomal or thyroid peroxidase antibodies. As we have seen, the immunologic dogma during the early 20th century was that circulating autoantibodies, uh, circulating antibodies exclusively target non cells, namely bacteria and viruses. However, in 1956, Dolian and Lloyd described the autoimmune etiology of a common human disease. So why did it take 50 years for the paradigm to shift? First, it wasn't until nearly mid-century that technical advances allowed Rose and Lutetsky to perform their rapid immunization experiments. Second, the clinical insight and careful data collection of Dolian was partnered with the basic science expertise of Lloyd. This collaboration led to their series of immunologic studies using human tissue that in turn generated this leap in the understanding of human, of human disease pathogenesis. During that same 1997 Welcome Trust Symposium, Julianne and Lloyd retraced the evolution in understanding of autoimmunity spanning almost 50 years and emphasized that the key elements in their paradigm changing work was teamwork and collaboration. Other notable scientific contributions made by Professor Dillian included the defining the autoimmune basis of other diseases and being among the first to recognize that genetics had a role in autoimmune disease etiology. Further, her early development of autoantibody assays was instrumental in their adoption of routine diagnostic clinical tests. In summary, I believe that the Devadoniac journey of discovery reflects several key characteristics shared by successful clinical investigators, namely having knowledge of scientific precedence, keen clinical observation skills, and an inquisitive mind willing to challenge dogma. Also important are the ability to formulate a test hypotheses, often in conjunction with committed collaborators, and the willingness to share knowledge and insights generously. Thank you. I will now call upon uh, Sandra McLaughlin to share her reflections on the subsequent impact of Dr. Billiard's contribution.
uh, and showed promise early on. She received a special prize for the graduate in the sciences. And then she went on to get a PhD. Her doctoral thesis was supervised by inorganic chemist Enrique Gutierrez Rios. Uh, and for that thesis, she traveled to southern Spain, to a region that's quite mountainous, uh, and examined correlations between urinary iodine concentrations and the presence of goiter in local residents. This turned out to be quite a momentous decision for her, not just scientifically, but personally, uh, because during her doctoral thesis research, uh, she met this man, Francisco Escobar del Rey, uh, known as Paco, and they, he was doing his thesis based on the uh, utility of iodized salt in the same region of Spain. They were married in 1953, and they were not only husband and wife in a very successful marriage, but they were scientific collaborators as well until his death in 2015. Now the two of them in 1955, after completing their PhDs, traveled to the Netherlands to do postdoc um, at the University of Leiden with Andres Kirido, who's considered the father of endocrinology in the Netherlands. There they studied thyroid hormone metabolism using radioisotopes, and this photo of her mentor for this postdoc, uh, Professor Carrido, uh, was in uh, Gabriella's office as well, and this was always in a prominent position on her desk. In 1958, Gabriella and Paco returned to Spain, where they founded the Thyroid Study Unit of the Spanish Research Council. And they remained in Spain for the rest of their careers, although in 1974, they transferred to the Faculty of Medicine at the Autonomous University of Madrid. At the bottom here, you see Gabriela and Paco in the early 1960s, uh, just after they'd returned to Spain from the Netherlands. So using those techniques that she learned during her postdoc, uh, Gabriela carried out multiple studies using sensitive and specific REI assays. Uh, she was able to detect T4 and T3 in different tissues with great specificity, and she was very interested in determining that individual tissues regulate both the formation of T3 from T4 at different different rates, um, with most marked effects in the brain. In this paper in 1966, she examined the close relationship between T4 deionation and activity, uh, which led to the proposal that T4 is the pro-hormone and T3 the active hormone, which of course went on to be definitively demonstrated by Lou Braverman, Sid Ingbar, and Ken Sterling in their very seminal 1970 paper. Now, Gabriella was also influenced by this scientist. He, of course, came far before her. This is Ramon Cajal. Uh, in his lab in the 19th century, he was a famous Spanish scientist, uh, a neuroanatomist who, in fact, went on to win the Nobel Prize in Physiology in 1906. He was the first to describe dendritic spines. And among the first studies Gabriella did on the brain was to show that the number of dendritic spines in the neurons of hypothyroid rats was markedly reduced and that their distribution along the neuronal shaft was markedly altered. In this study in 1979, uh, she was able to look at the effects of thyroid hormone uh, on neuronal anatomy and to note that the number of spines along the apical shaft of the pyramidal cells of the visual cortex was markedly reduced in hypothyroid rats. Uh, and in fact, this was most important, uh, seemed to be most important for development in early life. Now, she was doing this work in the 1960s and 1970s in the background of conventional wisdom that basically went like this. So this is a quote from a review article in 1960. It says, although it's clear that hormone secreted by the mother becomes increasingly available to the fetus at the end of pregnancy, it does not follow that this has any influence on fetal development. The earliest stages of growth and differentiation presumably take place in the absence of thyroid hormone since maternal hormone appears to be unable to reach the fetus during this period, and the fetal thyroid has not yet begun to function. That was 1960. 1981, a review article here in the New England Journal by Del Fisher. We're still kind of in the same place. The fetal hypothalamic pituitary thyroid system develops free of maternal influence. The mammalian placenta is impermeable to the natural iodothyronines, T4, T3, and reverse T3, as well as to pituitary TSH. So this paper in 1984, I think represents Gabriella's major seminal discovery and her huge kangaroo leap and her huge advancement in the thyroid field. So she used these radioaminoacids 
to measure T3 and T4 in rat embryos between 8, 10 and 18 days gestation. And what she was able to document was that these tissues contained T3 and T4 from the earliest days of study, despite the fact that it was well known at that point that the fetal thyroid did not begin to function until day 18. Therefore, these must be maternal hormones. So she went on to conclude uh, in this paper that statements denying a possible role of thyroid hormones in early embryogenesis ought to be reconsidered. And she spent the next few decades doing just that. In this paper in 1990, she demonstrated that the fetal brain is absolutely dependent on T4. So in hypothyroid uh, mothers, when administered, T4 could reach the fetal brain and generate T3. But if T3 was administered, it crosses the placenta, but does not reach the fetal brain. And you can see that here. This is one of Gabriella's own slides. And this really forms the basis for our current clinical recommendations that pregnant women should not be treated with T3-containing uh, thyroid hormone replacement. She was a superb mentor to really a whole generation of Spanish thyroidologists. Here she is with Paco in her lab in 1990 with several of her close collaborators, Drs. Obregón, Hernandez, and Calvo. Here's a paper from 1997 examining the effects of iodine deficiency on the neuroanatomy of the rat fetus really demonstrating that iodine deficiency could create some of the same defects that were seen um, in the offspring of hypothyroid mothers. And she was very passionately invested in translating this work into actual care for human patients. So based on her concerns about the effects of iodine deficiency on brain development, in 1976, she actually initiated the pilot program in Madrid for neonatal congenital hypothyroidism screening uh, that became a national Spanish screening program. And based on about half a million births annually in Spain, uh, they have detected approximately 150 cases per year um, of congenital hypothyroidism. This means that her work has probably directly led uh, to 6,500 fewer Spanish babies who would otherwise have experienced um, irreversible brain damage. She was a lifelong advocate for salt iodization as well. Salt iodization was mandated in Spain in 1982, but initially not very well implemented. But ultimately, the country achieved iodine sufficiency in 2004, and it's listed in current maps on the Iodine Global Network website as being a sufficient country. However, she realized in 2008 that although the country had become iodine sufficient based on the use of iodized salt, that in fact pregnant women in Spain remained iodine deficient, uh, something that's subsequently really been shown in many other parts of the world. And therefore, she was a strong advocate for iodine supplementation in pregnancy. So to, in 2007, which is a year after the ATA made similar recommendations for this country, she recommended the administration of an iodine supplement, 200 micrograms of iodine daily, to women preconception, throughout pregnancy, and lactation importantly as a public health me me method that would not require waiting for any kind of confirmation um, that individual pregnant women had inadequate iodine intake. And I think this has actually been far better implemented in Spain than we've managed to make it happen here. This is one of her slides uh, from 2007 from a review article just putting together a lot of the data over the course of her career correlating fetal neuroanatomy with the effects of maternal uh, iodine deficiency, fetal iodine deficiency, maternal hypothyroidism, and looking at the potential downstream effects of increased um, risk for attention deficit uh, hyperactivity disorder, for lower IQ, particularly verbal uh, and language uh, disorders, and for hearing loss um, and deaf mutism. Her work was widely recognized. She won numerous awards, uh, including many national Spanish awards. Uh, in 1985, she was a recipient of the European Thyroid Association's Henning Prize. And in 2009, she received the ETA Search Lysiski Career Award, which is given to individuals who are senior scientists who really have a tremendous body of work that has advanced the field of thyroidology. And I would note that as of 2019, she remains the only female recipient of that award. 
Here she is in 1999, receiving the National Prize for Medical Research uh, from King Juan Carlos and Queen Sofia of Spain. She was a leader as well in uh, European uh, endocrine societies. She was one of the founders of the European Thyroid Association uh, in 1967, and in fact became its president from 1978 to 1980. She at the same time, more or less, was the president of the Spanish Endocrine Society, and she also served as the vice president of the Spanish Society of Biochemistry. She ultimately retired in the year 2010 uh, at the age of 80, but in fact she remained scientifically active really until her death uh, at the end of 2017 at the age of 87. And I would like to turn the podium over to Juan Rumel to share some reflections about her.
upset with the transfer of scientific research to society. And always citing the regulation of children and rights, especially in the context of, uh, of uh, a unity in faith. And for this reason, she and her husband, uh, Paco, became involved with great effort to implement uh, Santa Unination in the country, even with some opposition from the Spanish authorities that uh, uh, thought that Santa Unification was only uh, needed in places where there were goiter, the big goiter, not for the general population, they have to show as Dr. Chris explained, that in the Madrid area, the school children, they, they had also minor uh, iron deficiency and they needed to, to have uh, supplementation. Now, in the last uh, years, there have been many, uh, the last two years and since uh, she died, there have, has been many, many acts for recognition in Spain. And uh, one of them is the, the publishing of the book by, by the uh, uh, University of, of Madrid called La Vieja Monreale, Her Time, Her Life, and Her Time. It's a very nice book. The problem is that it's only in Spanish. There, there is no translation. So for those of you that can read uh, Spanish as uh, Don Correcto, <laughs> uh, you, it's, a, it's a nice book. It's a beautiful book. So, um, as uh, you know, Gabriela, uh, well, the, the age of retirement in Spain was 65, but Gabriela remained in the laboratory working for about 50 years more uh, until uh, uh, 19, until two years before, before she died. And her last uh, appearance in public uh, in a meeting was uh, with occasion of, uh, of uh, receiving the Pacific Prize from the European Academy Association here in this uh, uh, photograph, uh, the prize granted uh, by President Luigi Magdalena. And uh, so she was uh, many years working after, after retirement, done 40% of all their uh, production was for, for that time, from the, the 50 years after the retirement. So with this, uh, I will finish my, my presentation and thank you very much for it. So I'd like to close the session by making an important announcement. I hope we have managed to convince you. I have been on my slide account. Please don't take it away yet. <laughs> um, I hope we've managed to convince you that there are some women thyroidologists who have made tremendous contributions to our understanding of thyroid physiology. I would point out uh, that at the American Thyroid Association, we have a number of named lectureships, all of which are named after thyroid luminaries, all of which are named after people who have made major contributions, and all of which were extremely well deserved. Um, but I would also point out that all of these named lectureships to date have been named after men. And we felt at the board that this was perhaps no longer the most appropriate scenario. And so it gives me great pleasure to announce um, that starting in 2021, which will be the next full annual meeting of the American Thyroid Association, we will be inaugurating the Valerie Ann Walton Distinguished Lectureship Award. I think you'll all recognize that this honors somebody who's made tremendous contributions uh, to our understanding of thyroid disorders, uh, and somebody who has actually also been a 53-year member of the American Thyroid Association. So this will continue to be an award that is offered and available to individuals of all genders, um, but we felt, again, that it was really important to have an award named after a female thyroidologist. So the Valerie Ann Gold Distinguished Lectureship Award will recognize a person who's been instrumental in collaborative research that has significantly contributed to the advancement of our clinical knowledge of thyroid conditions. Thank you for your attention. Time of recognition for our Solwyn presenters. What a wonderful group of presentations, I think. It was wonderful, all of you. Uh, at the, Rebecca, if you could please stand up. Um, I want to specifically recognize Rebecca because she got a call and said, you know, we think this is a good idea. Would you run with it? And she ran with it very much. And each of our presenters will be receiving a certificate. They'll be individualized and will say to all 
to whom these presents shall come, greetings. Be it known that the American Thyroid Association recognizes Rebecca S. Bond, M.D., for participation in the Clark T. Solomon Historical Vignette, awarded this 31st day of October 2019, 89th Annual Meeting of the ATA, Sheraton Grand Chicago, Chicago, Illinois. And I have one for each of our members. Sandra, if you can come up. So instead of giving them out, she's going to receive one instead. So Elizabeth here. And Juan, if you can. And Juan Bernal. And that ends our session. Thank you very much.